Hey guys, this is Emma, Vivo Barefoot's Head of Sustainability, and I f***ing hate the word sustainability. Join me as I talk to a whole bunch of people way smarter than me about how we're all going to make regeneration the new normal. Hey guys, welcome to the Vivo Barefoot Regeneration Broadcast. Our guest today is a friend of mine and someone I've had the pleasure to work with for many years now, Vicky Brennan. She's the CEO of Proudly Made in Africa, which is a charity which helps organizations and business in Africa. So welcome, Vicky. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thanks, Um, Emma. (laughs) Let's start with, yeah, the fashion industry. Let's start there. So it's been long criticized for its treatment of environmental and social issues. So how did you get involved in it in the first place? Thank you for that introduction. Um, It's an absolute pleasure to be here. So I have had a very unconventional trip through the fashion um, industry. So I went into Primark uh, as a poster assistant, I think was my first job title, and worked my way into the buying house. Uh, And then when I got into the buying house, I could kind of see that there was an ethical trading team and that kind of was more aligned with my own personal values and my kind of academic experience. So I pushed to get onto that team and then I got onto it and stayed there for a couple of years, met your lovely self and uh, just kind of decided then after a little while that it was time to move on and um, went to the Bangladesh Accord. Stayed there for just under a year and then after that took up my role um, here in Proudly Made in Africa. So when I was with Primark, they had been just starting to look into sourcing from Ethiopia. So I was part of a delegation that went out there to assess what that new market would look like. And kind of just sounds very cliche, but I kind of fell in love with that part of the world very, very quickly. Africa was going through, well, East Africa in particular, was going through this really rapid industrialization and development all uh, at the hands of kind of private sector investment. So it it is still a really interesting place to be from that regard. And it it is and probably will be the new hub for low cost clothing manufacture. So let's Um, talk about that because I think when people perceive their things are being made in Africa, um, you know, I think people have a kind of misconception of what that means. And I think what you're talking about in terms of so many different countries being involved in that industry, almost bringing Mm. it to life and then obviously having a huge hand in how it's run right now. It's almost kind of comes onto the first question, which is around how, you know, the coronavirus crisis Mm. has not just currently right now affected the industry. And there's a lot of discussion around how brands are responding to that at the moment, but it has been affecting the industry now for about six months, I think. And is is that Mm. right? And and talk to me about how it's, how it's kind of playing itself out down there. So, yeah, I feel like um, for anyone that doesn't know or read up on kind of what happens in the fashion sector in Africa, I feel like it's kind of, there's four or five different ways to view Africa. So one is kind of the thing that we're all really accustomed to in this part of the world, which is the charity case. It's kind of, you grow up in school, giving money to poor children, your poor counterparts in Africa. And then you grow up thinking, why is Africa so poor? Why is this? Why is that? And you keep giving money and that's the kind of the big aid model. And then there is this other part of Africa where it's an investment opportunity to Chinese suppliers because the cost of labor in China is too high. And then there's the other side where there is kind of a rich artisanal tradition of people who have a lot of the skills that Europe and America are seeing in decline, like tailoring, cobbling, different things like that. And and those skills are very, uh, they flourish in Africa out of necessity. So there's a few different kind of things going on in Africa and all of that is being hit by COVID-19 in different ways. We can talk about the impact of this pandemic, uh, but it's it's the same for everybody, but it's it's different for Africa in that trying to get an emerging nation's industry off its feet is difficult. And then when you suddenly lock that down, it has a huge impact on people. So you're kind of pulling people off farmlands into factories. They let their farmlands go or they subdivide it out amongst their family, which means the yields on the farms are a little bit lower, which means they can't really turn a profit from farming. You move them into factories and then all of a sudden you have to close the factories. So what do people live on if there's no social insurance net to catch them? Um, The fashion sector is no different from any other sector in that regard. I think what brands in this part of the world need to kind of understand 
And some of them do and some of them don't. And then some of them do and they don't really act like they understand it. What, what they do need to understand is a job in South Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa is different to a job in Europe. The job is supporting dependence you know, exponentially dependence of dependence of dependence. And when you take the job away, there's nothing to stop that person falling into abject poverty the way there is in developed worlds. So when you're buying from countries in developing nations or exploited nations, as I like to call them, you have to just be mindful of what your job is actually giving that person. And you can't take it away as easily as you can in other parts of the world. Or you can do that, but it maybe is irresponsible too. That's the interesting thing though, right? Because as you know, as we both know, the fashion industry is particularly guilty for um, (laughs) (coughs) making hay while the sun shines. And I think it was all too easy to see lower, you know, as you say, lower wages, lower production costs and move Mm. into these countries. And um, so let's talk about, you know, you kind of alluded to what some of the actions have been. We've seen both in the press a lot of backlash around how the brands have responded to their supply chains at the moment. And and as you say, these brands are operating in countries where there is that safety net. Um, And most of them do have huge asset bases and a lot of cash. And they're just trying to avoid, you know, loss of sales. It absolutely, like, it baffles me. Sometimes I... Like you and I were in Paris in February at the OECD. And um, I mean, I have read the outputs from that forum for the past maybe six or seven years. I've had input to them through kind of my superiors in uh, the different teams that I've worked on. Sitting there, I just felt, ve- it just felt very, very surreal. I was sitting there and I'm like, we're tying ourselves up in knots here, trying to find solutions to, you know, they are global problems and they're multifaceted, but they're, it's not rocket science. Like, I mean, People are poor and there are ways to develop people who are living in poverty or not what they need to be developed. But, you know, there's, there's ways to support things sustainably and effectively. Um, we're tying ourselves up and not here. This is a bit brash, but like during this entire crisis, I've come to the conclusion that one of the simple solutions for doing life is just mm. don't be a dick. <laughs> yeah, like the, the old Google mantra, do no evil, right? Do no yes. harm. It's like, I think one of H&M statements around COVID-19, the, one of their public statements was, oh, well, we'll make sure that anyone who was involved in the production of clothes that are made, that they will be paid. And I was just reading this, just going, or you could just pay for what you bloody ordered. Like you could just pay <laughs> for what you ordered. Why are you tying yourselves up and not trying to find the cheapest way to do what you know and what you have said publicly is your duty to the workers who make your clothes. So to be fair to H&M, I think they have come around. I've seen a few subsequent statements that they've said they'll pay for everything that's made and they'll pay for everything that's kind of beyond the point of no return, that it can't be changed. You know, that almost kind of then goes into the second the, the second point there, which is, you know, mm. are they doing it because the, these ethics are inbuilt into their organisation like they claim <laughs> to be? Or are they doing yeah. it because it's just too big of a PR nightmare? And they I mean, I just think when we're expecting businesses to behave ethically that's just silly like well firstly because ethics are subjective like what I think is right and wrong is probably could be different to what you think is, is right and wrong probably that isn't so these Emma. brands that you're mentioning they're part of the ethical trading initiative they have signed up to a even, even like ethical trading like is to me an oxymoron trade is trade trade is trade is trade like you you trade to acquire wealth that's what you do it for. Acquire wealth or acquire something you need, which in the case of all of these brands is wealth. Yeah. Like that, that's it. There, there is no right and wrong attached to that. So when we try to put things into good and bad boxes, I think that's where we come a cropper because they're two different things. What you can try to say to a brand is, you said you'd do something, you haven't done it, do it. Do mm-hmm. it or we stop mm-hmm. buying from you mm-hmm. or do it or we make it so that you can't sell anymore. Mm. Um, and I feel like, as you said, you know, as so you, it is PR <laughs> versus the yeah. The and as, as you alluded to, I think that there are lots of different solutions to this that you know you could have also considered. And I think mm. you know, we had a conversation with um, our CEO Galahad, and he mentioned about the difficulties that y- you referred to in terms of mm. stock at this time, where yeah. you 
you thought you were going to be operating yeah sure the new one and so you, you obviously have issues you need to you need to manage and at the same time one of our biggest risks the business is that we have a very vocal community and they've mm. been putting a huge amount of pressure on us that we keep being out of stock and it's quite yes. interesting from a sustainability yes. perspective mm. i've been pushing the business to only produce what we really need to give the mm. world but mm. that is obviously so impossibly hard to predict yeah. and trust rating gets dragged down by people who are just so frustrated that things aren't mm. available when they want them yeah. and you know the two don't match up and so i guess i come back to the point around it is these big brands it definitely is these big brands but i think mm. that there are there are really awesome solutions available to the more agile the more mm. ethically orientated business yeah. So yeah. we've obviously faced the same solutions and we no by no means perfect, but being able to kind of encourage a more partnership, you know, back and forth yes. with your suppliers is a huge solution as part yeah. of that, where you can obviously negotiate payment terms, you can, you know, mm -hmm. place long-term plans so that you can yeah. support each other. All of those things are like really into intense solutions, but it comes back to the point around the fact that the big brands set the example and the industry yes, underneath do. them. And the expectation. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and the expectation the is, is, is trended by and operated by those examples. But yeah, I think you said something really interesting there, uh, like having partners instead of suppliers, because the supply chain isn't linear or it shouldn't be linear. It should be interconnected. And yeah, and we're not even talking about circular fashion here, but like the interconnectivity between all of the layers of the supply chain. I think it's very easy to sit in a in a brand and think that that's not the case but again back to my old buying days which kind of you know shout out to a lot of the primark buyers like they definitely had this ingrained into them without anybody telling them they had to do it because of the ethical trading initiative and because of uh purchasing practices it's just a shame it doesn't back roll to, all the way up back but to anyway be a dick. yeah like if all of the producers decided do you know, we're not going to source with these people anymore because like, what's the point? We don't get any money from them. And when we do get any money, it barely covers our overhead. So there's actually no point in working as hard as we do. So we just, I mean, a lot of producers, they just say, no, we had a bad experience sourcing with that brand. So we just don't do it anymore. We don't see the point. And actually African brands or African producers are very astute um, when it comes to deciding who they'll source with. And now that makes it difficult when you're working on a project that's involved in kind of trying to industrialize the continent and diversify export trade from it. Like I remember I did a sourcing project a while back and we were going to use a Ghanaian print house. And uh, we said, listen, the buyer uh, wants to use organic cotton, but they can't the, the MOQ, your MOQs are, we say, 10,000, 15,000 pieces. What's yes. MOQ? Oh, apologies, using silly uh, lingo, um, a minimum order quantity. So basically factories will set up uh, these numbers and they'll say, if you want to order anything below this number, it's not worth our while opening a production line. So this factory's minimum order quantity was 15,000, but the buyer was buying less than 10,000, which he wanted the supply chain to completely change to organic cotton, which is, you know, a noble request, um, great to move to organic cotton, but you need the cash to back it up. So that's the kind of, really, to me, the dynamic. Example. I love this example for two reasons. One, mm. because it just highlights again how disadvantaged small to medium yeah. businesses with the greatest of intentions are mm. in this game because you mm -hmm. just can't compete with things like that. Yeah. And even if you can compete, it's going to cost you twice as much. So again, one of the questions we constantly get is why are our products so expensive? Yes. Here's mm. the answer. And the other part of that I find really interesting was what you're talking about in terms of, you know, actually maybe it's more economical for these people to work in their local markets and their regional right. markets. Right, yeah. And, I, and, you know, coming back to what's going on right now with, with coronavirus and, and mm -hmm. the reaction and the crisis there, you know, how are these people responding? Are they actually, because everyone reads the media right now and believes that these people are, are quite literally out on the street not being paid their wages. You know, what are you hearing in terms of economic reality that's happening mm -hmm. on the ground there? So a lot of the producers that we work with are already trading domestically. And most of them are online because their domestic trade covers vast countries. So it's easier for them to trade online than to have like maybe one standalone store in a mall. Um, 
that has not massive footfall. So a lot of them are pretty agile. Like we talked about kind of uh, small businesses being able to adapt quickly. The problem for them is the market size is small. And then when when the economy suffers from a shock, which like like our economies here, mass scale unemployment would be a shock, then they worry about who their consumers are and how they're going to get their product out to market. But in terms of the global picture, outside of the industrial parks that feed the big brands like PVH and H&M, the artisans that we would work with or the SMEs that we would work with, it's their domestic business that they're concerned about. But to give you an example, in Ethiopia, the Ethiopian government have said that no employer is allowed to lay off workers, even if the business has to close down. I, I mean, I can't really say much more than that because I kind of I saw the news alert on Wednesday and I'm still reading through and kind of getting some feedback from people who I know who are there to ask them, like, how is that going to work? I mean, it's noble. workers. But we're not you can't lay them off. You. We're not supporting you as a government. Oh yeah, of course. Like you just have to keep your payroll going as normal, but with maybe Very no income. Interesting. Yeah. Can you imagine so, how that would play itself out in the US or the UK? Yeah, it's interesting. It's it's very, very interesting. Um, so yeah, watch this space in terms of Ethiopia. And then Ethiopia are also dealing with the fact that they send a lot of migrant workers to uh, the Middle East and the UAE. The UAE have deported like a couple of thousand people um, back to Djibouti who now have to try and make their way to Ethiopia um, because they don't want any foreign workers in uh, their country. So the IOM are looking after the repatriation of those people, but they're going to have to sit in quarantine for two weeks somewhere, miles away from their home, miles away from their temporary home where they work. Um, yeah, so they're in limbo. Every single year at the end of the financial year, we're expected to write a corporate responsibility report. And mm-hmm. God forbid that we do not post some kind of progress on those targets that we set, right? Mm-hmm. So we should be improving people's health and well-being. We should be improving the water footprint of our business. We should be improving the carbon footprint of our business. But mm-hmm. it's totally reliant on me, this young individual with a super passion for the world to change, to somehow tell this person, his family, his livelihood, his community to care about a ton of stuff that I care about, but he may or may not care about. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. And that kind of goes back to the partnership thing, doesn't it? Like that you're, it's this top down approach to, we've signed up to all of these international protocols uh, and this is how we shove it down into the layers of the supply chain we know exist. Totally. And I'm so interested to hear your take on um, the reaction to that to many brands and, and companies in this industry is to pull out of it, is to retract. Oh, no, no, the problem's too much. The solution yeah. would be that local manufacturing, which we know is a farce because actually 99 point something percent of materials are coming from Asia anyway, including chemicals, et cetera, et cetera, equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And the second bit about that is that automation, either automation or local manufacturing is a solution. <clears throat> and let's I mean, all the these automation thing, like <laughs> communities, you know, that had jobs, that expanded their jobs, mm. let's leave all of them out on the limb. So we probably start with automation. Every so often I see something that pops up on LinkedIn that says, oh, look, at this new robot, it can make a T-shirt by ionizing the water and it makes the T-shirt hard so you can cut straight lines. And then you dip the T-shirt in a different solution and then all of a sudden, bish, bash, bosh, a robot's made a T-shirt. And you think, yeah, great. And you go to these hugely automated, uh, beautiful, crisp white factories in China uh, that makes shoes. And then when you go down the production line, it's still a man with a hammer and some nails because that's how you make shoes. <laughs> I mean, you can do the injection stuff, but the cemented shoes, that that's how they're made. I was shocked when I went into my first footwear factory in China, like genuinely shocked. I was like, my God, it's so manual. How, how do they churn out stuff so fast, like when it, when it being still this manual. And then when I moved to African supply chains and the whole thing that PMIA does is we say a job is the quickest way for a person to develop themselves. A job is the quickest way for someone to lift themselves out of poverty, not just any job, a decent job that pays a decent wage that allows them to kind of support their families and save for a rainy day. And when I joined this role, something that people kept saying back to me going, but you know, when the robots take over, the Africans won't be able to make uh, cheap clothing. 
So what will they do then? <laughs> so, like that is firstly ridiculous. But secondly, the, the thing that I always say back to people like that is, okay, we're a little while away from automation to, for it to be rolled out on that mass scale. Like I think Amazon warehouses in Birmingham are one thing. I think clothing factories are an entirely different thing. And I'm going to say something which is quite depressing, but nobody has ever, well, I've never kind of, despite the research I've done, I've never seen this to be untrue. But basically for automation to take jobs in the fashion sector, the automation has to be cheaper than the cost of labor. And we're years away from that, and to clarify. That it's quite close to home for Vivo because mm. our CEO is a seventh generation cobbler. He believes in artisanal skills and, and that's why mm. he does invest in Ethiopia, which is obviously yes. you know, how we end up working together these days. And I think it's really interesting because it's so easy for people to kind of put that in a box over there and not think about that human element behind how something ended up with yeah. that. Again, you know, we get a, a lot of complaints about small scuffs or small imperfections on products and therefore, a, you know, a kind of ton of returns for people yeah. that are expecting perfection. Mm -hmm. and I, I guess I genuinely, you know, kind of coming back to the coronavirus crisis that we're currently in again, I, I guess I genuinely really want to believe that you know, the people that really vital part of supporting these communities coming, as you say, out of poverty and kind of being able to have a decent job and, and are making our footwear <clears> for <throat> us. I really genuinely really want that to be put into perspective. And, you know, that's part of why we're doing these, these podcasts. This is the 50th year anniversary of Earth Day. Can you believe it? It's crazy. Years we've been wow. talking about this same mm. thing. And it's, I struggle to think that we've made a ton of progress, but I do believe that there are more and more people talking about it and caring about it. I'd be interested actually just kind of to try and wrap us up a little bit. Mm -hmm. How do you see the environmental issues we have and opportunities we have intermingled with a lot of the kind of humanitarian and social topics that we've spoken about today? I, I was speaking to somebody else during the week and someone said, you know, it'll have to be different once we're all, once we all emerge from lockdown, emerge from our houses, like the world will be a different place. And so the cynic in me says not a lot's going to change because people have been cooped up for so long that they'll just be itching to get back out and back shopping and, and they'll want to go shopping where they've always gone shopping. But the optimist in me says that for the people who are sitting in, who have realized that actually they don't need that much stuff. And actually not going to the shops every week to buy something to wear to the pub every Saturday is not the end of the world. I hope that there's more of them than I think there is. Um, well, and I hope that they will see the change. I, you and I see through that, right? You and I know that the fashion industry is much more than just, you know, a kind of small handful of people that are willing to kind of mend their own <clears> clothes <throat> and, and buy mm. something. And, and I suppose like, you know, when we think about the fact that we came from one of the world's biggest decentralized, almost invisible organizations. Like what, what do we need to do? Like what do we need to do to kind of change so that? You, you've said a couple of things about the Vivo custom, which I think are really interesting. So you've talked about kind of how people don't realize how hands-on fashion production is when they're giving out about minor scuffs or a wonky edge on something that's been cut by hand. Well, of, of course it's going to be that way because a human has touched that. You know, Fashion Revolution is next Friday, the 24th of April. And I think a big piece is about education. So it's education at all levels, right? It's educating brands on how they can do supply chains better or do it with a more human approach or understand their responsibilities more and educating the consumer to understand what it takes to get something from a cotton field onto a shop in the high street um, or, you know, out of a, a, a cattle herd um, and onto a shoe rack. People really need to understand what goes in. Um, I, I still believe when big brands say, you know, you can do two euro 50 t-shirts ethically in inverted commas, even though I explain why I don't like that word. I agree with them. You can pay a minimum wage to a worker and get the t-shirt out at that price. But what I now understand is somebody pays along the way, whether it's the supplier that has done it on no margin so they don't make any money because they need the volume to keep the lights on in their factory, or whether it's the fashion brand at the other end that is making a loss selling something that cheap because they need people to get in the door. Like somebody makes a loss. Somebody, it costs something somewhere and even then if everybody is making bank on that two euro 50 t-shirt which we know they're not but if they are 
the planet is suffering because they're ordering a million of them. The, the world doesn't need a million more T-shirts every six months. That's yeah. just ri- ridiculous. Like, it's absolutely ridiculous. So and anyway, I, I think to cut a long story short, it's about education. No, no, it's fine. Like, I mean, you're an absolute <clears throat> wealth of knowledge on these topics. And I hope that having this conversation with, you know, whoever ends up listening to it um, mm. is going to help people to ask more questions I mean that's the only thing we can really you know that's it yeah at this time and and to not take everything at face value and to really kind of dig deeper and I think there's only one thing I wanted to touch on what you just said then in terms of we do have to challenge the status quo in this industry and Mm. I mean in my opinion I don't think there's been a safe space to do that and so you know again coming back to how everyone's kind of changing their culture and their behaviors at the moment I do really want to believe that there's a, a tipping point of courage. And I, and I want to believe that people are going to start having the guts to ask these questions and to want to know the answers and be comfortable with the answers because mm. you know, we do need to know them. And I think, I think one of the interesting things, you know, coming back to what we started with, which was about how the brands have reacted to the supply chain. You know, one of the really interesting things that I'm finding even the experts in this space don't understand is that, and I'm, I don't know about Africa per se, but in some of the Asian countries, definitely some of the suppliers behind the brands are actually wealthier than the brand yes. they're looking for. <clears throat> that was something we wanted to talk to you about, yeah. Completely, <laughs> completely almost kind of missing you know, missing any level of spotlight around their behavior mm-hmm, and their mm-hmm, mm-hmm. workers at this time. Yeah, absolutely. I had a big circle around that uh, to make sure that we spoke about before I said my goodbyes. Um, the super wealthy suppliers. Yeah. So I suppose to start positively, I think the super wealthy suppliers, I'm thinking of denim expert in Bangladesh, the guy who kind of talks about what, what the experience, because he wasn't always that level um, where he's supplying everybody and, you know, making a tidy living. But yeah, motivational speaker coming right from the coal phase of production. That's one way to kind of level the playing field a little bit. I mean, no one is going to try and <laughs> cut Denim Expert uh, down to size because that guy no, has no, no, a wait, megaphone. For anyone, for anyone listening to this podcast that, that is the first time exploring what the fashion industry looks like, there is a handful of very, very big suppliers that make every single denim jean product on the planet. It may blow some people's <laughs> minds, but do not think that every single brand has some kind of wonderful, beautiful story. Oh, this is the thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and actually, on that subject, I find myself, you know, when I've had too many glasses of red wine on the sofa, um, on my Twitter feed or sometimes on my Instagram feed. Do you follow, uh, maybe people who are listening to this podcast follow Diet Prada? Um, on Instagram. So it's this lady who is ex-fashion industry or still in the fashion industry, I'm not sure, but she's kind of worked for luxury brands and magazines. And her favorite thing is calling out megastars or big brands for copying small artisans and small, uh, smaller fashion houses. Mm-hmm. So she calls out Kim Kardashian all of the time for wearing kind of unique small house clothing and then copying it for her own fashion line. <laughs> um, that's kind of one of her personal favourite call outs. Do you know, I think that we need to kind of start thinking about our language when we talk about suppliers and producers. So for me, the suppliers, those super, super wealthy suppliers are working probably with, you know, more than one factory. So they might have like an arsenal of factories sitting underneath the same name. They yeah. they have blocks of production in a whole host of factories and they kind of get a huge scale order and they see where the production capacity is and they say, oh, I'll place 10,000 here and 15,000 there and 20,000 there. And uh, if we need to move it all around, then we can. And we'll just tell the buyer that the product is all being made in that really, really nice factory that they visited um, that has all of the ethical certifications. But actually it's been made two miles down the road in my mate's factory. Ethical um, and environmental certifications. I mean, that's oh, yeah. obviously... You know, considering these podcasts are coming out on Earth Day, that's mm. an interesting thing to talk about because... Well, yeah, know, the ones with the circular water system. Yeah, and I think this is interesting because I obviously came into Vivo Barefoot some time ago now at a time mm. where I was blown away by the passion of the individuals in this business. Everyone from the founders to, you know, the finance team to the products team. And it's really interesting because they all thought that they were doing the best possible thing. And then suddenly we started to ask some questions around 
what the supplier meant by biodegradable. And we found out that actually, you know, it was a, you know, almost complete farce because it needed to yeah. go back to some like ridiculous lab to be able to actually be biodegradable. Yeah, it wasn't or, just a case to put it in your yeah, compost bin. Or, yeah. <laughs> or recycled content. You mm. know, what a lot of people don't understand is that a lot of the vegan leathers right now are, are still plastic. 80 to 90% <laughs> synthetic toxic chemicals and mm. materials. And mm. it's, it's quite interesting because obviously when you work in sustainability, when you do what you and I do, we can't have these conversations. And you don't want to overload people who mean well. And I mean that from like the SME brand to the small scale producer to the consumer, like a consumer that's taken a stance to say, you know what, methane output from the meat industry is so, so bad that I'm going to be vegan. So I don't want to wear leather shoes. Yeah. Now, that's a noble thing to do. But actually, you and I know there's a ton of other things that would have a bigger impact on the isn't, planet. Isn't than, like meat production and leather industry in Ethiopia like one of the top, top things that they're doing to get their people out of poverty? Yeah, and I kind of, when I first went to East Africa, you know, I kind of came from the big brand thing of, you know, a lot of big brands were put under pressure to not use uh, animal products in their garments and in their footwear and in all of this stuff that they sell. So a lot of people signed up to that. So it was, in, it was drilled into me to, to go out to brands and, or to go out to factories and say, is this leather a byproduct of the meat industry? Mm. And, you know, sometimes in India it's not because they don't eat meat in a lot of states and they have to import their hides from a different country and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I got to East Africa and I was like, is this leather a byproduct of the meat industry? And everyone I said it to on like my, the first two days there, and then I stopped saying it, uh, they were like, yeah, because the carcass of the animal is worth like a hundred dollars. Like I'm just using yeah. that as an example. Yeah. And the hide is worth 20. Like we would never kill anything. The one thing that I enjoyed so much when I was out in Ethiopia, as you know, we source wild hide, mm. which is a yes. term, you know, obviously not officially certified. But obviously we yeah. invest a, we invest a ton of energy in, ter in terms of making sure that it is truly wild yeah. reared. it is regenerative in terms of it kind of yeah. living in in coexistence with a plant and animal based agricultural um, mm -hmm. wild system anyway the point being that I spoke to a few of the farmers and I just found it so uplifting to understand their stories like you know yes. yeah walk five or six cattle around during the day. They almost are friends with these cattle. A lot of them yeah, it's, their, it's their family herd. It's, yeah. their, it's how they live. Their, it's pastoralist, basically, exactly. would be the language I would use. And when they bring yeah. them back, they pay them this respect of mm. understanding that their life was given to feed their families. You know, it was part of their herd. Mm. It was part of their family. Speaking about kind of these certifications and factory-led um, initiatives, there's a lovely tannery. I can't believe I've said that <laughs> those two words out loud. Because tanneries generally aren't nice places, but this tannery is quite nice. I mean, how they work with their farmers is they have this education process because, you know, some farmers, they do have to walk their cattle for quite a long time. Um, and some of them do use the whip um, or do use swatches to, or switches, is that what it is? Switches to get cattle moving up the street and stuff like that. The tannery had noticed that some animals aren't as well cared for from some farmers as others. So they've engaged in this education program with the farmers to be like, your animals have to be watered. They have to be well fed. You can't use uh, whips on them because it damages their hide. So, you know, okay, they're making a business case. They're making a, a monetary case for treating animals well. But the net effect is still the same. The animals get treated better. Uh, yeah. So animal welfare improves. And then, you know, that small scale farmer gets to use every inch of his animal when he slaughters it. And then that goes back into his or her family. I always um, find it really funny because we, uh, when we use wild hide, which we do use wild hide in, mm. our, in our products. Um, yes, yeah. Sometimes we get people complaining about the stretch marks in the castle. Mm. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that cow has had a very long life. That's why yeah. that stretch yeah, marks. Mm -hmm. As you know, Vivo Barefoot works with a couple of factories in Ethiopia. And one of them, we've obviously recently had a, a kind of ethical audit on. And obviously one of the results that came back was some of the workers weren't 
you know, they weren't working their hours as it was. And mm. I thought that was so fascinating because, you know, as someone who doesn't know a lot about that kind of culture out there, um, it's very, very normal to walk off at, you know, 3 p.m. Yeah. and go back and see your family. Yeah. You know, yeah. And that's it's, it's, what the expectations are in this industry around that ethical thing that you talked about before. And what does ethics mean in mm. different cultures? Exactly. Yeah. And, and if you walk into a new market blindly, not knowing that, then um, you're just setting yourself up for failure. Um, We spoke a little bit about those huge suppliers. Um, I would, back to our kind of overarching theme of this evening, which is the education piece, I would really like to see, well, them being welcomed into the fold a little bit more. Uh, Firstly, like I think, you know, when you go to big initiatives like the Ethical Trading Initiative um, and a few others of, of their ilk, they, they tend to focus on brands because that's where the consumer attention is. And a lot of suppliers say that when they join these initiatives at the behest of their buyers and brands, they find it very, very difficult to to do anything because they're being their, their hands are being tired by what the buyer dictates. But those super, super sized suppliers don't have those problems because yeah. as you know, as an SME brand, the supplier is dictating the terms to the SMEs. Yeah, so I would like to see a bit, not even necessarily a spotlight. I don't think there has to be a negative campaign, but I would like to see them being brought into conversations a bit more. Um, There are obviously gigantic, very wealthy suppliers that are doing the right thing. Um, Yes. But the more involved of us listening to this podcast, Arvind is one of them. They are quite involved in a lot of stuff. Avery Dennison is a supplier to most Yes, yeah. They're very, very involved and they're definitely hiring the right expertise. And I think it would be interesting to understand who of that community and and how to engage the consumer on asking that community of suppliers to to kind of take action and to do the right thing. Um, I would kind of say, and I don't know if this is real utopian sector, (laughs) utopian stuff, but I would really love to elevate the conversation a little bit more out of kind of this is good and this is bad and kind of into a more like how do we all work together to make this a better planet to live on and how are you know how are we nicer to each other but for the good of the planet like Mm -hmm. I feel like these huge exposés in the media actually the media is another stakeholder that needs to be brought along um on this on the journey there's you work for what i consider to be a social enterprise Mm -hmm. and they they are doing their best they don't want massive scale growth they don't want to be the biggest footwear brand on the planet they're just trying their best um and they've got a mission and they stick to it and then when you joined you were like actually you could be doing x y and z a bit better and here's how i will help you do that like that, that's the way to have these conversations. And that is the way that we're going to find improvement and have a sustainable existence on the planet. And as you say, not just sustainable, but regenerative, because yeah. I would love to see that word sustainable banned because it doesn't mean anything. To me, it's like ethical. It means different things to different people. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm so, I'm so <laughs> on board with anti-competitive. Let's work together. Yeah. You know, cut the bullshit. Let's like, you know, and, and talk. I, really, I really want to believe that this pause that we've been gifted, and I, I do really want to appreciate that a lot of people are suffering right now, and it is a tough time for a lot of people. It is. Um, you know, I, I still want to believe that there is a time where we've realized our own mortality, we've realized our own existence and our interconnectedness on this planet, mm. um, and that the, the only future we can have is a regenerative one. And, and that's yes. both from a human perspective and a a planetary perspective. So thank you so much for taking the time, Vicky. It's been Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> such a joy. Yeah. And and if you want to hear more from Vicky, where where can they go? I suppose the best place to start would be www.proudlymadeinafrica.org. We are Proudly Made in Africa on Instagram. We are Proudly MIA on Twitter. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> Thanks a million. Good talking to you. Bye. Bye. Well, that's it for today. If you managed to get the entire way through this podcast without getting really annoyed by my bloody Australian accent, you deserve an award. For more information and to listen to the other episodes, go to vivobarefoot.com. See you later.